Poke the Bear is brought to you by Price Picks and the Game Time app. And welcome into Poke the Bear, episode 254, presented by Prize Picks. Go use that promo code CLNS to get up to $100 cash back on that first deposit. And we're presented by Game Time. Go use that promo code CLNS uh, to get up to $20 off uh, that first purchase. Terms apply. I am Evan Marinovsky. That is Connor Ryan. Connor, what is up? Evan, I'm doing well. How are you doing? Doing great. Doing great. Just had two full days at the Foxborough Sports Center watching fall hockey. So hockey's back. We're back. Hockey season's back. That's like the fir- my first sign. Captain's practices are next week. So happy. Praise the Lord. That is good. Uh, as we used to say at CCD when I was little, God is good all the time. All the time. God is good. So thank you, God. Thank you, Bruins. Uh, thank you, hockey, for coming back into the fold. Um, it is exciting. It's an exciting time um, just in terms of we're almost out of August. We're almost there. We've almost made it. Uh, and the, it feels like fall. I mean, kids are back in school. Um, so, I mean, I, I just, I, I, yeah, I know today is hot, but it doesn't, doesn't matter. Fall, fall is here. We're almost there. Um, Again, as we said before, Evan, like, you just hope we don't get into the middle of September, early October, and it's still like, 81 degrees or something like that i'm yeah i'm ready for it to be like 60 right now i'm ready i am already i went to duncan today i got my pumpkin swirl my cold brew i'm ready for sweatshirt and shorts weather i'm ready bring it on i have to ask how was the gold raising canes let me tell you it was uh, i look at where uh my first experience at raising canes (laughs) on comav at uh, Boston University, I will say uh, the founder of Raising Canes was there and called it the University of Boston, which I was like, oh, I mean, he could have called Ooh. it Boston College, could have called it College uh, of Boston. So the University of Boston makes it sound it was like, horrendous. <laughs> it's like, that's not the name. But um, you look at where uh, I think most of us have been exposed to that Raising Canes on Comav. This one covered in gold. Uh, it was quite the experience. You had Drew Holiday there. You had David Ortiz. You had a little lab. And it was like uh, like the classic, like, because like Raising Kane, like Kane is named after the owner's like dog. It was like a lab. So oh, I thought you meant like a, 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 like a science lab. I was like, what are you talking about? It's no, like, no. What are they like making the sauce in front of you with like the little, I, you know, the, the, the no, they don't, you, don't, you don't want to know how the secret sauce is made, but no, it's not. I thought you were worried that I was saying like Kane, like the wrestler. I'm like, no, he was not. It wasn't true holiday Kane and then David Ortiz or anything like that. But no, they had, no, a, I, they had a little I, Labrador. Now I get it. I'm a Labrador, Labrador retriever. He's very cute. It's one of those labs that like the big like block head. You know those 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 kind Did of. Did I see? Stuff. I think I saw. Was that the video you tweeted earlier? Yes, the random dog okay. that I posted on. Yes, that was. Well, I, didn't I just thought there was some random I didn't dog. Just randomly like... post a dog. There's nothing wrong with that. Like I, there should be no, more I, dogs. I wish you do it more. We should but, do it more. Uh, but that was probably the highlight was the dog. But yes, it was good to good to be out and about. Uh, it's always an eventful day when your assignment is to go to Raising Canes at eight in the morning to see David Ortiz and Drew Holiday. But it was fun. Did you at least get like free chicken? I mean, I didn't stay to see if they were going to offer a free chicken because I'll be honest. Like, I listen, I love raising canes. I don't really want raising canes at like nine in the morning. That's true. Not too early. It's true. I, 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 it's true. There was one time I was out in Arizona and with, with a few of my buddies. And again, all be you guys. We love raising canes. So we saw out in Phoenix, there's like 25 raising canes. I don't know. I don't know why. They're all out in Phoenix for some reason. And like, they open at like 7 a.m. So we had to get up early because we were doing like a like a hiking trip and uh, all right, if they're open at 7 a.m. You have to imagine it's kind of like, uh, you know, Chick-fil-A, one of these things, maybe they got like chicken biscuits or something like that. We stroll in at 7 a.m. right as they open. They look shell shocked that we're <laughs> there that early. They're like what the fuck with Are your you- backpacks and like your walking yeah. sticks <laughs> yeah. coming in. Turns out it's great chicken tenders. Like that's all they do. Like 7 a.m. It's like <laughs> you're going to have <laughs> Texas toast, <laughs> fried chicken and so we had that at like seven in the morning it was still good but i had a little bit of a rumbly in my tumbly the rest of the day yeah that when the poo says yeah um is that does the one on com have open at 7 a.m i don't think so 
So uh, we were rattled. We're like, oh, it's going to open this early. There's maybe, or maybe it's like a secret menu, like in and out burger. No, they stick with what they got, and it's it's friggin' chicken tenders, and they're oh, great. Oh, that's but tough. At seven a.m., it's 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 not necessarily what I really want that early in the morning. No, it isn't. Oh, that's like fried chicken too with the cane sauce at seven a.m. Like seven p.m. Sign me up. I like strap me, and I love that. But seven a.m. We have like a we have like a four hour drive from like phoenix up to like flagstaff right after that too so that's just just gurgling in your tummy the whole time dude it's it's a little dangerous man that is such a risk <laughs> that, that there goes that raising cane sponsorship but i had a great that, time there evan that that poor car um anyways <laughs> windows had to be down on the road trip. yes um <laughs> anyways uh, something else that stinks. <laughs> These the Jeremy Swayman contract negotiations now Good are segue. heating up. Yeah, great segue. Uh, are heating up. Season uh, is about your you know training camp. Everything about to start. Uh, and uh, Jeremy Swayman went on the Shut Up Mark podcast, which I actually watched the video of. I believe they're sponsored by uh, Dave Spot Chicken. So we're just <laughs> crushing <laughs> we're all just the chicken. <laughs> We're We've hit that point in the off. You know what? I'm just glad we have something to talk about this stage of the offseason. So let's talk about let, let's add Zaxby's after a couple of the other ad reads, and we'll do that too. Yep. We'll do Zaxby's. Bojangles. Do, Bojangles, yes. Bojangles. Uh, which I heard they, they actually have pretty good food at Bojangles. Bojangles um, I enjoy. So I've, I've never been. been spending most, I don't enjoy like going down to uh, the parts of the, the country in which there's readily available Bojangles, but the food itself is pretty good. <laughs> That's that's good. I've never had it, so I'll have to try it. Uh, anyway, Swain went on the Shut Up Mark podcast um, and was asked, basically, how is this all going? How are you feeling about it? This and that. And he said, quote, if you were to ask me that question a year ago, I would answer truthfully and say it's scary. It's a lot of resentment towards people that you want to succeed. And when you're not being compensated for your endless efforts, it's a nerve wracking feeling because it's your family you're fighting for. Uh, the answer I'm going to give you this year is that I've educated myself. I understand the business side of it all. It's given me a complete new mindset of understanding the business and how to react to it. I understand the cap is going up and where it will be in years. I understand my comparables and how I can't ruin the goalie market for guys that are going to be in my shoes down the line. I went to the School of Business for the University of Maine. And I love the business side of it all. Those were sort of the big quotes. Um, he gave a pretty long answer uh, to those guys on that. A um, lot to take away from that. There's a lot in there, I think, that is worth us, you know, picking apart. Um, I, I, you know, when, when you say you understand the business, like that to me is sort of where, like, I don't know if anyone truly understands the ins and outs of it. I understand where he's coming from and that he went through a, you know, crappy arbitration hearing last year. I get that end of it, right? Um, kind of, you know, going through, not something similar, but, you know, you're back in the negotiating table a year later. Um, I like the confidence. I like the confidence. Um, did any of this worry you? I mean, listen, first of all, as we reiterate time and time again, Evan, this is a pro getting the bad, getting the bag podcast. Uh, are, that yes. being said, um, I am very curious to see how this plays out in terms of what exactly Swayman and his camp are looking for in terms of an annual payout. Right. Cause I think that's probably the biggest question mark and is looking at, what that final number is going to be. You have to imagine that the Bruins, especially if they're paying a premium on this guy, want to sign him long-term at this point. Um, but yeah, it all comes down to, you know, are we talking seven, seven and a half, just where we feel like we were going to be in, you know, May even when the season ended, where he really kind of elevated his stock to, are we looking at like nine, right? I mean, I know Debbie, uh, uh, Rich Keefe uh, mentioned that he was, that Swim was asking for 10, I don't think he's getting that. I think what 10 is what Bobrovsky makes now. And I think only Carrie price makes more obviously price isn't playing, but you're kind of putting yourself in a different stratosphere. I think you're doing 10. Um, but so is it, you fall in between of looking at like eight and a half million. And again, like Swayman mentioning these things, like I think him talking about the fact that the cap is going up, the fact that he has to, you know, his contract is going to impact this goalie market which we've talked about time and time again, right, in terms of looking at what guys like Shesterkin are going to make and what, you know, guys like Jake Ottinger are going to make. Like, that makes sense, and it, it makes sense why him and his agent are, you know, that's on their mind as they kind of negotiate through this 
ongoing kind of contract stalemate. Um, but if you're a Bruins fan, I think it does kind of hit home the fact that, yeah, this isn't going to be the days of like the, the hometown discounts are probably at an end, especially when you have this guy that, Oh yeah. When you look at, um, you know, him being very vocal about the arbitration and how much he hated that. When you add in, you know, him trying to reset the market for goalies, when you got so many good young talented net minders that are, are do a bill and, and do a pay raise in the next couple of years. Um, Kind of, I think, just more or less hammers home that it's going to be a, a, a pretty steep price the Bruins are going to pay here. And I'm not saying that in, like, a negative, that I don't think it's going to be $10 million, but it feels like now, like, the floor is, what, eight and a half? And if you're the Bruins and you get this guy for that kind of, you know, you set the floor there, maybe that stings for right now. But, again, if you're banking on, you know, last year and the promise he showed being kind of the first step as he continues to establish himself, Maybe that's worth it, but I'm sure the Bruins probably went into this not expecting that, you know, maybe it's going to end up being eight years and around 70 million total if you're looking at eight and a half per year. I mean, again, I understand the cap is going up and where it will be in years. I understand my comparables and how I can't ruin the goalie market for guys that are going to be in my shoes down the line. That's a guy who's going to be asking for a lot of money. And are the Bruins willing to give that? They're, I feel like they're going to have to. I mean, you know, yes, you have Jonas Corposalo there. I get it. Who's an NHL, an NHL goalie, can fill in, you know, for stretches, we think, has done that in the past. But you're going to have to give something. The Bruins are going to have to give on this a little bit. Uh, and you wonder how much Swayman's side is going to give, right? Like, um, are they going to go below eight and a half, as you just said? Um, that's the end of it where, like, you know, I, it's nice to hear him this open. You know, to hear that, like, you know, he's actively to, to acknowledge that he understands you're not just getting a good price for you, but you're making sure that other goalies around the league, as you mentioned, Ottinger, Shesterkin, are going to get that kind of money. Um, you know, is he in that tier yet? Like, we think his projection has him in that tier. Right. But is he there yet? N- not really. Like, again, and I, I'm not trying to disparage Jeremy Swayman. We are pro getting the bag. And that, you know, good, get as much money as you can. But at the same time, like, are you, the, are you with Shesterkin yet? And I get what he means in the sense that, like, when Shesterkin and Ottinger go for their next deals, um, they'll get more. Like, that, you know, they want, you know, Swayman to be the floor. You know, if Swayman gets nine, well, then Ottinger's going to make 10, 10 and a half. Shesterkin's going to make, you know, 11 or whatever it is. So I get that. But, you know, he's been in a tandem the last three years. Like right. I, that's where, you know, and I, I, again, it's not trying to hit on, it's not trying to, you know, knock them down or anything like that, but that's the reality of it. And I think that's where the, that's what the Bruins have on their side is like, dude, we think you're going to be great, but you, you know, it's not like you played 60 games each the last three years and were outstanding. You played, you know, right now, the number, you know, 44 games 44. last year, 30, you got 44, 37, 41, and 44 is the high. Like, and I, and I, I, I like, to me, that's where, you know, I think his side has to be careful too. And I get it. Ask for as much as you want. I agree. But he's that's why I think we've said eight million all along. We've said, you know, seven and a half, stuff like that. That's realistic. That's a lot more than maybe what he's given you. Whereas yeah. 10, 9, like you hope he becomes a ten million dollar a year goalie, but we don't quite know that yet. So yeah. I think that's gonna be something they have to kind of navigate. Yeah, and it's kind of like even look at like the comparables, like a guy like Ilya Sorokin, right, who I think is making eight two five. Like again, Swayman, like again, it really helped his case of how great he was in the playoffs. But yeah, Sorokin's that a guy a that Sorokin is a guy that has played fifty plus games, sixty games, has been a Vesna finalist. He's got the individual numbers as well. That you look at his age and what he's done just from an individual lens, and you can see why they're comfortable giving him eight. 8.25. And again, you, you run into the thing of, you know, Swayman doesn't like the comparables, probably didn't like arbitration in which it's essentially a team bringing up a power plan as to why you suck or why your value is not where it is, right? But that's kind of the business of it. So I get the Bruins perspective. I think even Kim Neely mentioned, you know, Swayman's only had, you know, 40 plus starts. He was on uh, the Rich Hurton Leap show and kind of mentioned that. So you can see from the Bruins perspective why Hey, you're due for a, a pay bump. We think your franchise goalie. We're going to give you a bump, but it's not going to be nine and a half, ten million, right? It's almost like if, like the, you know, not to you know hit a raw nerve here, but it's like the Red Sox uh, had like Mookie Betts, 
and it was like before he was like an MVP candidate, like let's say like 2017, he had that one really good year and you could see he was a budding superstar. And Betts was like, I want 350 million. It's like, no, like we'll give you like 180. We'll give you like a nice contract to keep you a long term, but you're projecting maybe three or four years down the road as opposed to right now. You know, I think you're kind of hitting that where I think Swayman's viewing kind of the long term. And again, he's banking on himself that, Hey, if you want to give me 10 million out, it's going to look great in a couple of years. But the Bruins is like, I probably need a more of a sample size where we commit that much of our cap. And again, it could look better over time, but it feels like eight and a half million hits on, you know, paying what Swayman, what he's due. It gives them long-term security. It resets the goalie market. That's kind of the running rate. I think there's only five goalies making over 6.2 million right now per year. So that does kind of reset things, but we'll kind of see how it all plays out. I, again, I'm not, Hitting the panic button, not going to DEFCON 1 or anything like that. It just, I think, hammers home that there's a lot of factors in play and that I think you're looking at at least eight, eight and a half is kind of the floor now or like the maybe the, the sweet point in terms of where these negotiations hopefully go moving forward. Yes. Uh, I want to keep dissecting this because this is kind of a big development. Uh, first, though, quick word from our friends over at Prize Picks. Prize Picks is America's number one daily fantasy sports app with over 5 million active members. Prize Picks is the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Unlike other apps, on Prize Picks, it's just you against the numbers. All you do is pick more or less on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. Get in on the daily action with your friends and become part of the Prize Picks community today. Sign up today and get $50 instantly. When you play $5, you don't even need to win to receive the $50 bonus. It's guaranteed. One Caleb Williams passing yard gets you one win on prize picks every week in September. That's right. Only one yard gets you an automatic win every football weekend in September. Four weeks of free W's. Don't miss this deal on prize picks because it's gone when September ends. Prize Picks invented the flex play, which means you can still cash out if your lineup isn't perfect. You can double your money, even if one of your picks doesn't hit. Prize Picks is the only real money daily fantasy platform with an injury insurance policy so that your lineup stay in play, even if one of your players gets injured. If your player leaves in the first half and doesn't return, your picks are still live. Big questions going into the football season. Will Patrick Mahomes throw for more or less than 267.5 yards one week? Will Jalen Hurts throw for 240.5 passing yards another? Download the Prize Picks app today and use code CLNS and get $50 instantly when you play $5. That's code CLNS on Prize Picks to get $50 instantly when you play $5. You don't even need to win to receive the $50 bonus because it's guaranteed. Prize Picks. Run your game. Now, back to the show. So I do wonder when I look at that quote, I understand the cap is going to be up or is going up and where it will be in years. I do wonder with that if he, and, and this is something I mentioned throughout the summer, could do a shorter term deal where it's sort of like you mentioned with the Mookie Betts thing where it's like, okay, sign me for a couple of years. I'll prove to you in those three or four years that I'm worth whatever the cap is at that time. I'm worth near the max for a goalie, um, which again is a, a gamble on his part. That's a gamble on the Bruins part. Um, I, I also wonder if they go that route, if they do a shorter term deal here. Um, you know, as we've said, the COVID, you know, the, the COVID effects of, on the cap uh, still are a little bit felt, uh, but the cap is moving up. It's supposed to move up even more in the next, you know, three, four, five years. He knows that obviously. Uh, so I do wonder if, a sh if this means a shorter term deal is legitimately in play. Cause I feel like, Every time we've mentioned that, it's like, oh, maybe, you know, it's an option, but probably not. Long term always felt like the, the, the move. I don't know now. Now I think that might legitimately be on the table. If that gets him eight and a half, if, they get, if, if the Bruins get their price, right? Because if the price is going to be eight, eight and a half, and that makes the most sense for them. And then, but the term makes the most sense for Swayman in the sense that, hey, you get these four years and then we're going to see where the cap is down the road. Maybe that is how they come to an agreement and make sure this doesn't roll into the regular season. Yeah. I mean, if that, if it really hits a point where that is the stalemate and Swayman is so, you know, looking to bank in and make double digits in a couple of years, maybe that's the risk you run. I feel like it's just, it was like, it'd be like a Pyrrhic victory for the Bruins, right? Where do you get this deal done? You have this guy locked in, but man, 
it's not as fun when you have this goalie that if he lives up to his billing, and again, maybe it's a great problem to have. If he flames out, then you, he's off the books in a couple of years. You move on from it, but it's not good for the future of the franchise, right? If if this is a guy that becomes a perennial Vesna candidate, per, the Bruins probably don't like the fact that the cap's going up. That's great, but instead of having that extra flexibility to add another top six option, to be in the running if – Screw it. If Dreisaitl hits for agency next year, instead of looking like that, you got to look down the line and be like, shit, you got to give Swingman's going to be like, he's playing himself in line for 10, 11, you know, down the road. Like what happens when Shesterkin hits a free agency in a couple of years and he gets 11 and a half and all of a sudden the year before that, you know, that free agency, if Swingman's a UFA at that point and has the flexibility and he finishes second or wins the Vesna, what's he going to be do, right? Like again, that's maybe you kick the can down the road, but it does feel like if you're the Bruins, you want to just kind of tie this up in a bow and get it over with. So maybe, you know, the sides hit the point where you have to kind of settle for that, but it doesn't seem like that's a situation that really benefits anyone, right? Like unless you're swimming and he's confident of getting a bigger payday, but again, a whole lot of risk involved if you're trying to do another bridge deal and just banking on uh, what you have moving forward. I also think like he's not the first guy to have this, to sign a contract like <laughs> and i don't mean to sound like a dick but every player when they sign their long-term deal understands that as the cap goes up in a salary cap league that league that money probably will look cheaper that's just how it works that's how it's always worked with every contract ever and i i, I respect players who want to bet on themselves and make relative to what they're worth i totally i totally get it and i support it but like I, I also look at it and say, well, if you sign like if you want long term stability in one place, you're going to have to accept maybe that in year five, when you are the Vesna winner and you're making eight and a half, nine million dollars and there are three or four other goalies making more than you. That's just the way it is. And I, I know that sucks, but like that just that's the way it works. So um, I hope they come to an agreement long term. I still stand by my thing of they're going to get an agreement done. I think it happens either right before camp or a few days into it. Um, they don't want this lingering over them. They really don't. Um, and you also don't want him not to be on the ice. Um, that's the other thing. Like you need him to have a full training camp. This is a big year for him. You know, even if he signs that long-term deal, he is the guy. This is the first year that he is the starter. So, um, I, that's the other part of it where like you need hit his mind clear of this as soon as humanly possible. So um, again, as I, as you said, not, not time to hit DEFCON one, but a eh, little something, a little something, you know, makes a uh, little sweat starts to come down the forehead. But again, I think, I think everything will be hopefully okay in the long run. If it's not, we're going to have a lot to talk about. So maybe, you know, you sure will. That would be quite a bit. Um, before we get into some other stuff, uh, Game Time, our friends over at Game Time. Fall is beginning, which means football is back. And nothing beats a college football atmosphere. With both college and NFL games, who doesn't love a good tailgate? Get to the game with Game Time. Game Time has a new feature called Game Time Picks that makes getting tickets to see your favorite teams play live even easier. And Game Time Picks filters out the fluff to show you only incredible deals on great seats so you don't have to waste time searching through thousands of tickets. This fall, my friends and I are going to the Patriots-Titans game in Tennessee. How will we get tickets for the game? Game Time, of course. The Super Deal has been amazing to us in the past, and there's no doubt it will be great to us again. I just love the curated deals, which make it easier to find the best price on great seats. Some other features I love are the lowest price guarantee or game time will credit you 110% of the difference. Game time picks curation makes it easier to save more on sports, comedy, and theater all in pricing toggling. This feature shows the total upfront with no surprise fees at checkout. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time download the game time app create an account and use code clns for 20 dollars off your first purchase terms apply again create an account and redeem code clns for 20 dollars off download game time today what time is it it's game time 
Now, back to the show. So, Connor, you caught up with Charlie Coyle this week, not quite at a triathlon. It was at the Bruins Fan Fest event in Plymouth. Uh, there was no swimming, no running, no biking. Just... It was a rock. Oh, that's right. Yes, Plymouth Rock. So you did get to see that. You, you did get to see Plymouth Rock. Uh, but you spoke with Coyle, and he mentioned kind of, you know, reflecting back on last year, looking ahead to this year. And one thing he mentioned was, you know, taking on more responsibility last year. And then there was an interesting part of his quote where he mentioned wanting more responsibility this year, wants to continue to garner up uh, more opportunity, things like that. And I, I'm sitting there going, okay, well, he, he was on the power play. I was in second unit. Uh, PK, big PK guy. Uh, second line center, put up 60 points. What's the next bit of responsibility for him? Because Lindholm is there, ideally, mm -hmm. so that you can keep him as as sort of, you know, that next tier of guy where it's like, we don't need to give you a lot extra. Just thrive at what you do. Figure out what you do. Exactly. You've got all, you've got all summer to think of this. Um, big, I think you should leave reference. Yes. And people are thinking like, wow, he's really ripping Charlie Coyle. He's, <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> ripping the fact that he wants more responsibility. But like, what else is there for him to do? Yeah, I mean, I think for him, he's always looking to try to find ways to, to better his game. That's something that he viewed as a challenge going into last year where there's so much uncertainty. I think he wanted to prove not just to himself, but also I think probably to a lot of people who thought he was just best at you keep him down at the 3C, let him kind of take advantage of those matchups down there. And I think he proved that he could be a viable to a, uh, a top six player that can have an impact and kind of leave his impact or his imprint all over the game. As you said, he's, you know, second power play unit, top PK unit. You do wonder if maybe it's more of like a leadership or more of a vocal role moving forward. It, it's kind of funny that, you know, he was added right before the, the cup run in 2019, but now he's, I think, the fifth longest tenured player on the team. I was shocked to see that. Yeah, crazy. Yeah. So We're getting old. So, you know, I, I think it's one of those things where obviously I think you look at, you know, Elias Lindholm is your top line center, and it, his presence should make life easier for guys like, Coyle and Martian and guys further down the lineup where they should be able to, you know, they're not dealing with a matchup against a Barkov or a Matthews night in and night out, right? And that should alleviate some of the pressure. So do you wonder if it is more of just continuing to build his own game, but also be more of a vocal uh, guy? He mentioned that I think there's also a comfort factor where last year, as much as I think he was confident in being able to step up, there is that uncertainty. There is that kind of wading into, you know, uncharted waters with, you know, where that team was going to be last year, where you can be confident, but when you don't have the Bergeron and, and Krejci there, it's kind of similar to like this year with the, the goalie situation with, you know, Swayman's, I'm sure it's very confident with stepping in and being the number one guy, but when you don't have Olmark there, it's kind of your safety blanket. There is that kind of trepidation, that uncertainty that you have to deal with, especially earlier on in this year. So I think for Coyle, it's all about kind of being more of a vocal leader, but also, I think he probably has some of that more comfort factor where, all right, I know my role. I can still play at a very high level. I have Elias Lindholm further up the depth chart as well. That should make life easier. I can play my game and build off of, I think, the really strong foundation I put forward last year, which is encouraging yeah. for the Bruins. Yeah, and I think it, it, you hit it on you hit on it earlier. I think it's also leadership too, right? Like him, as you said, fifth longest tenured Bruin. Um, new guys, Lindholm's a door off. You got younger guys like, like Patra. Um, uh, you know, potentially Lysel, uh, Beecher, Merkulov, Lowry, like, and I also think Coyle, like Coyle mentioned, I think on Chicklets recently, Bergeron being the guy he modeled his game after. Um, now, again, Charlie Coyle is no Patrice Bergeron. No one is Patrice Bergeron. We understand that. But Coyle does play a game that if you're a coach, you want every center to play like that, right? Good two-way player, responsible, can pitch in offensively. Like, that's, that's a kind of perfect prototype of what you want a prospect to be and speaking of prospects connor we've talked a lot about guys that could make the team this year lysel merkulov patra duran but who are who's a bruins prospect outside of the system outside of the nhl and the ahl that you're going to follow quite a bit this year I mean, it's probably the cop out, but I'll probably go with the six eight guy that they just took yeah, in the first round, right? I mean, that, that's the obvious one with Dean Letourneau. Um, just because I'm just so curious to see where his where you kind of project him by the end of this year. You know, he kind of accelerated his timeline going to BC this uh, this fall with Will Smith going up to the San Jose Sharks, um, a guy that 
is viewed as, you know, you see the talent, you see the intrigue of his skill set. Still a pretty raw player. You look at the competition he played against last year. Going from that to Hockey East is a big jump. So I think it'll be fascinating to see where he kind of ends the year. Like, is he a guy that exceeds expectations and is like a 30 point guy as a freshman, which would be great. Is he a guy that finishes, you know, 18 to 22 points and has a, and becomes a really key piece of that BC team as a freshman, which I think the Bruins would absolutely take as well. Or is he a guy that kind of goes through, you know, the growing pains that come with such a steep jump in, in competition. And he's a guy that I'm sure Bruins fans would freak out, but is he a guy that is a fourth line, nine point kind of guy in and out of the lineup maybe that first year and kind of grows into the role moving forward. And I think the the Bruins have mentioned that they're going to be patient with him. I think, you know, BC, which has a great track record, you know, under Coach Brown of developing these guys and putting them in six, in positions to succeed. Um, I think they've all mapped out that he's a guy that they're going to, uh, you know, let develop at his own timeline. But if you do have that at the end of the year where he is a fourth line guy on a Admittedly, a very deep BC team. Um, I do Bruinsians kind of freak out about that. So I'm just curious to see where he kind of ends, uh, you know, at the end of the season uh, and where he is kind of moving forward. Because I think you can get, you can map out any of those three different paths for him as a freshman. Well, I think if he's fourth line with nine points, I also worry about that transfer portal where it's like, you know, I don't want him transferring out of there. That's the thing. Yeah. Like, I like that coaching staff. I think the Bruins love that he's in their backyard. I don't think they want him going anywhere. Now, I mean, maybe he'd transfer it, you know, somewhere in Boston. Yeah, the University University. of Boston. He would be a star at U of B. I I think I projected earlier in the summer that he's going to be somewhere in that 20-point range. Um, You know, again, he'll be in the top nine. That's their plan for him. At least it was, you know, a month or two ago. So obviously things have changed or could have changed, but they haven't really been on the ice much yet. So I, I don't think it has. Um I, you know, I, I think fans have to expect that there are going to be growing pains. There are going to be highlights of him getting walloped. There are going to be highlights of him, um, you know, kind of having shifts where you're like, what the hell was that? Like, and people, you know, locals who are going to go to BC games or if BC plays BU or Northeastern or whoever, like they're going to watch him and go, I didn't notice him, you know, most of the game. And that's okay. Like he's still very young. It's a, it's a long road. He is not coming in next year to be the number one center. He's ideally your number one center five, six, seven years from now. Like, it's a long road. So there will be those growing pains. There will be those issues. Um, there will be times you look at the line chart and go, why is he the third line center? Um, I'm not saying don't worry, because, again, there can still be worrisome things in there. But... It is year one of a very, very, very long development road that most first round picks don't go through because they're more kind of surefire things. Again, like we talked about this in the draft. He was ranked on some 18th. He was ranked on some, you know, 98th. Like it, it, it just, he fluctuated. He's a project and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. So, um, Letourneau is a perfect one. I think that is the number one answer. That's, I don't think there is a close second, but. Quinnipiac, I think Quinnipiac, if you guys are down in Connecticut, you want to watch some ECAC hockey, Elliot Greenwald, third round pick on D this year, Um, Chris Pelosi, third round pick last year, their first pick in that draft. Um, I think Pelosi is a really interesting one, just what he can be. Um, Again, this was a guy when they drafted him, had been in the NAL and the USHL in the same year, which... I can't tell you the last guy I drafted out of, the, out of the NAHL. Not to disparage that league. It's a great league, but it's not one that's sending a ton of talent to the NHL. So he's an interesting one. Had a good year last year in the USHL. Um, Greenwald, again, I've, I've maintained. I think he's going to be a very solid you know, two-way defenseman. Um, another one's Beckett Hendrickson at Minnesota. Yeah. Now, I, I love college hockey. I know you do too, so I'm kind of overlooking some of the junior or the CHL guys. But Beckett Hendrickson. He was the fourth round pick last year, center. I uh, was with the national program formerly, so um, USHL last year. So uh, that's another one, I think. You know, uh, uh, if you want to watch some Big Ten hockey, uh, everybody gets, I think, the Big Ten network if you still have cable. So we just cut cable, by the way. And now I will go downstairs and be like, all right, got to turn on, you know, whatever. And ESPN, and uh, nope, not there. So um, tough. 
tough for sure. Um, anyone else? Anyone else that you have your eye on? Yeah, I mean, I was gonna say Pelosi is my my next pick. There just feels like that's the guy that um, you're intrigued by, like the motor that he has, the, some of the speed. Um, guy that if he kind of continues to build and kind of fill out his frame, could be a you know a guy that has middle six upside with that kind of physicality the Bruins are kind of targeting. So I think he's definitely a guy that I have on my list. I'd hopefully get to a couple of Quinnipiac games, especially if they head up uh, around this area because there's a, get a lot of bang for your buck if they're playing a team like BC or some of these other hockey East teams. Yeah. And, and Quinnipiac always is good. They've, you know, yeah. continued to progress and um, for the ECAC, like they, you know, they've been the sort of the dominant team the last couple of years. I saw recently Corey Pronman ranked uh, Bruins prospects. Where was that breakdown of all 32 teams? The Bruins one that didn't have the one that didn't have the one that didn't have Oscar Jelvik on it. Uh, I believe so. So his, I think his rankings, uh, so low Ryan Beecher can't be included. But he had uh, number one, Dean Latorno, number two, Dan's Luck Mellis, which is fascinating. UMass and guy. again, UMass, UMass, UMass guy. guy. So, so I, I'm full for it. Uh, number three, Matt Patra. That's I, I, you know, and again, Corey works his ass off covering prospects. So it's I, a very I'm tough gonna, job to do that for it a is. single team. Uh, I am not going to sit here and be like, what is he? What does he know what he's watching? Uh, number four, Fabian Lysel. Uh, number five, Jonathan Morello, who recently decommitted from Clarkson, which is not <laughs> shocking at all. Um, and nothing against Clarkson. I'm not saying that, but draft pick um, who, uh, who, you know, I think Bronman at the time really liked. So I, I am curious, like, where he ends up. Um, Patra three fascinates me. I don't understand that. Um I, you know, again, like he played well in his time in the NHL last year. I think you and I have been pretty realistic with him in the sense of like, don't expect him to be like the number one guy going forward, but potential number two center, like I think is completely in the cards. Um, I, I don't, you know, I mean, Pronman wrote Patra's a tough valuation. He got off to a scorching hot start this season, uh, making the Bruins a teenager and looking like he belonged. 15 points in 33 games look good on the power play. His game started to trail off toward midseason, though, and his World Juniors for Canada was average. That is all true. Um, he is very skilled and intelligent, makes a lot of difficult plays with the puck, and he can run a pro power play. He can create off the edge while also showing no fear of attacking the inside despite being 5'11". It all comes down to his skating. He's not that fast for a smaller forward, so he'll need to be excellent with the puck to have a long career. The guy I saw in October and the NHL NHL looked like that player, but we'll see how consistently he can play at that level. Um, he's expected to make the Bruins again a notable role, but I'm not 100% convinced he's a long-term NHL player. See, to me, Patra does have the long-term thing. It's more like, can he be a star? Can he be a legit guy? Is he, I think yeah. he's more sort is, of is yeah, he, middle Is he a 40-point yeah, guy, or is there you know, a 20-goal, 45-assist kind of season? And look at the poise, the playmaking. You're, I think you're intrigued by what you have there. It's again, he's a guy that isn't really flashy, but like neither was like David Krejci, and he was pretty poised with the puck. I'm not saying that he's gonna be David Krejci, but like no, but you saw right. a lot. Of, you see a lot of that poise with him last year. So, and I and get yeah, like, I, what were you gonna say? I was gonna say, and no Jelvik for a guy that was over a point per game as a sophomore on a very good BC team, but. I routinely am impressed every time I see Jelvik play. Again, I know. Not saying, he, not but, saying he's going to be an NHL lock, but a guy that should have a pretty good pro career, whether it's the AHL or the NHL. But that's a guy that I think has very good upside. And I agree. Driving, and I think drives play without just relying on that supporting cast at BC. I agree. And I think the knock on him is the size element. But again, like that doesn't mean like I think he's going to be a terrific pro. Whether as you said, whether that's AHL. Um, coming up the NHL here and there, like I think he's a good player. Um, I really liked him at Dev Camp, but um, yeah, I that's an interesting list. Uh, maybe Lock Mellis. We got to put Lock Mellis higher. So go watch UMass hockey too. Yes, don't uh, don't forget about them. Um, Connor, what can the people look forward to from you over at the Globe and Boston.com? Yeah, we'll have covered uh, every step of the way over these final days of the off season. Thank God. Um, have a couple more stories coming out, looking at uh, previewing training camp. Uh, we'll have you ready for captain's practices. I spoke to Andrew Raycroft a little bit about uh, not just Jeremy Swayman, but Corpus Solo and why he's high on him uh, bouncing back this year in the Bruin system. So all that stuff will be over at boston.com and the globe. So read it over there. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can at Connor Ryan underscore 93. 
Go do all that. That is Poke the Bear, episode 254, presented by Prize Picks and Game Time. That's Connor Ryan, Evan Marinovsky, Poke the Bear listeners. Have a great rest of your week.